Okay, thank you very much to the chair, anyway. Um, I'd also like to reiterate everything that has been said by our chairpersons and particularly to thank Professore Cittadini and Professor Luca Gianaroli for the wonderful invitation and honor, particularly the honor to address you this afternoon. I think we've all lived through a wonderful medical science and a wonderful era. And I hope what I'm going to show you this afternoon is that it's had its challenges, as we all know, but it, it's got a very interesting history. One that some would say has quite a few surprises. Surprises maybe in how the challenges were not just met, but why they were there in the first place. But I'm going to take you all the way back to Walter Heap, where anything in our field, to some extent, really started with this man about 128 years ago. When he wanted to ask the question, does it really matter if you transfer embryos from one species, well, one variant of a species to another? And he did the first transfers in rabbit. And why did he do this? What was his reason for doing it way back in 1890 or just before? It was, he first of all wanted to know that what was the use of the, the uterus and could it be changed from one variety to another for fetal development? Did it have any effect? Does the foster mother, interesting question today with epigenetics, have any effect on the fetus? And does a foreign ova in the uterus of the mother affect the offspring that, that is born? And he concluded the uterus of one variety can be successful medium for the fertilized ova of another variety. And the uterus of a foster mother exerts no modifying influence upon her foster children in a single generation. And what was behind all of this? Well, behind all of this at that time was the question of heredity. That's where he was coming from. He wanted to know whether or not in terms of future experiments in this field, there would be an effect on heredity. But we have to wait an awful long time for, I think, the very big question. And it was the first time, I believe, that the question was asked about whether oocyte maturation was at all important. Was it essential to fertilization? And we know this was the work of Pincus in 1935. And what Pincus was very clear about in his work on mammals and some human eggs was that no normal fertilization can be secured when you remove eggs from the follicle. And he laid out the stages of oocyte maturation in mammals. And he said that the period for human oocyte maturation was 12 hours. Well, he got it right for most of the mammals that he studied, but he got it wrong for the human. And that was critical to this pathway that we see in our history. We then wait until 1944 when the question mark is raised about whether we have the first in vitro fertilization of human eggs and cleavage. And this is the publication in Science in 1944 with Mencken and Rock and his assistant, uh, uh, Miriam Rock, sorry, Mencken and, and his assistant, Miriam Rock. Now, they looked at 800 human follicular eggs, which were isolated, and they exposed 138 of them to spermatozoa. And they actually got advice and did a lot of work with Gregory Pincus. And this was the first publication that they had of a human egg, which they believe was fertilized and cleaved to a two-cell embryo. And as is acknowledged here, most of the work was done by Miriam Menkin, Dr. Rock's research student. And they further published more information on cleavage in 1948. And then we await another 11 years till this man, Landrum B. Shettles, appears on the scene with his paper in Fertility and Sterility on the moral stage of human developed embryos in vitro, after fertilization in vitro. And he is an interesting character in our history, as you will see shortly. 
However, although the timing seems about right, 32 cells, he was saying, in 72 hours, it's a little bit uh, well developed, he published this, uh, this information. And when you actually look today at those embryos, those of you who know about human embryology will raise both your eyebrows and wonder, what were they? Were they really human morally? And this was 72 hours post-insemination. So there was a backdrop there. But what is amazing, we had to wait 25 years since Pincus and Ensman for some other young chap in his uh, graduate years to be interested in the question of really what is oocyte maturation? What is its process? And did, and he didn't know Ensman hadn't got it right by then. He wanted to repeat Ensman's work. And Bob, as you see here, is a, a young student dressed slightly differently in those days to now. He was at Trinity College, Cambridge, but he, he was doing his work. He was at a meeting here doing his work actually in Edinburgh. And this really started his passion at this time by trying to understand the processes of oocyte maturation. He was oscillating between doing genetics and immunology, emerging fields at the time. And then we come to 1965, five years later, it took him to understand the elements of oocyte maturation. And it took him five years because Ensman got it wrong. He had this very rare material, human eggs, and he was trying to get them to mature in the time frame of Ensman. And it, it wasn't working. Now, he also made a very interesting statement in this pivotal paper in 1965 in The Lancet that Pincus and Edmund almost almost well, certainly got it wrong. They were erroneous. And they probably didn't have fertilization. And Shettle certainly didn't have fertilization. And he made his statement on the basis of what? He made his statement on the basis that they hadn't proved the time period of oocyte maturation, the, process, the individual processes of oocyte maturation, which in this paper he demonstrated from germinal vertical breakdown to metaphase two, and the whole period of being 36 to 43 hours. And he demonstrated that eventually with a few final legs before he was going to give up in trying to understand this maturation process. And he believed that without this knowledge, you could not confirm that you'd ever achieved fertilization in vitro. It could be questioned. Mencken and Rock could have actually got fertilization in vitro. We will never know. But what we do know is this was the very first time that human oocyte maturation was broken down into its components irrevoc irrevocably and absolutely correctly. And this is why the 65 paper is pivotal. Right, okay, the hard work's been done. He can now get eggs. He knows all about oocyte maturation. All I've got to do is fertilize them. So in 1965, he sets off to try to obtain more human eggs and get them fertilized. What could be difficult what about that? What could be harder? Well, He's working a long time to try to get fertilization, and it's not happening. He works with gynecologists in London. He works with gynecologists in Cambridge. He gets oocytes from as many places as he can. He cannot get fertilization. In the end, it is suggested as a roundabout route, because he was beginning to change his ideas to move into immunology, that he would go to the Joneses in the United States, a recommendation, actually, from a, uh, 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 his, his wife, Ruth, who, who knew individuals who knew the Joneses. And they were very welcoming. We'll give you eggs. We'll achieve fertilization. Off he goes, 1965, to the Joneses. He still cannot get fertilization. In 1968, he meets Patrick Steptoe. And as we heard this morning, from Professor Gortz, it's, it, 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 it was much easier to then start to obtain oocytes by laparoscopy. They met at the Royal Society meeting in London. And Steptoe was working at that time in a small hospital outside Manchester called Oldham, in Oldham. And that's when this important meeting happened in 1968. So he started to get some eggs from Steptoe. And 
most of you who will know a little bit about reproductive biology will remember that in this time it was believed the sperm had to undergo this process of capacitation, whatever that was. They had to gain the capacity to fertilize an egg. And this was jointly found by Chang and Bunny Austin. Now, Bunny Austin was chairman of our department in physiology in Cambridge. Or he, he, sorry, he wasn't chairman of the department. He was head of our sub-department that employed Bob Edwards. And here in the early 60s, it's Bunny Austin with Bob Edwards. And these guys jointly discovered capacitation. And Bob religiously followed the belief about having to achieve capacitation in whatever way this was. He would try to get sperm out of the uh, reproductive tract of women. He was in the newspaper as being noted as trying to carry sperm around in the oviducts of rabbits, any way he could to capacitate this sperm to bring about the process of fertilization. And it failed him. Until 1969. His then PhD student, Barry Bavister, was working on hamster and hamster eggs and hamster fertilization with a culture medium for that particular job. And he used, worked with Bavister to use some of that culture medium on some of the eggs that he had to try to achieve fertilization. And it worked. So finally, in 1969, all those years after he discovered oocyte maturation, and for those of us today, we wonder why it took so long, but it did, he finally achieves fertilization from the eggs obtained by working with Steptoe and the culture media from Barry Bavister. And it was no longer necessary to actually recover sperm from a female reproductive tract. Whether capacitation was necessary or not, the sperm would have the capacity to fertilize in culture medium. Very important, thankfully. So, the next part of the work, in the very early concept of let's try to use IVF in women, began in earnest in 1969 to 71, where they wanted to repeat oocyte maturation and IVF to be absolutely certain they could do this. And this meant, where Cambridge is here on the map, Edwards traveling all the way up to this little hospital here, it's a cottage hospital called Dr. Kershaw's, to Oldham, outside Manchester, where the patients were, where Steptoe was, and where he could get his eggs to ultimately nail oocyte maturation and fertilization. So the first clinical IVF began in 1971 on Steptoe's patients. From 1971 to 1975, they used Clomid and HCG, Clomid, Pergonol, and HCG. And they undertook 150 cycles with no success. And then round about 1974, there was a congressional hearing in the United States. And amongst others, famous people like James Watson absolutely decried the attempts at IVF as demonizing terminology. It should not be allowed. It was about this time that I joined Bob Edwards. There's a little picture of me there, and there's Bob there with a little group at the Marshall Laboratory subsection of the physiology department in Cambridge. In 1976 to 77, they switched. Bob thought maybe stress was a problem. Maybe there were high levels of prolactin, which were measured to be high, but transiently high. So let's throw in some bromocryptin. Well, they tried bromocryptin. 180 cycles with no success. So maybe we're getting the picture now and trying to understand how is it it's working today? Or why wasn't it working then? And the enormous stamina it required to keep going. So they decided in 1977, because 
there are serendipitous things that happen. There are parallel events in, always in our, in our medical scientific lives. They decided to watch the spontaneous cycle. Let's go back to the natural cycle. Let's not, maybe it's the drugs that are causing the problem. And about this time, Mashida Pharmaceuticals came out with a hemagglutination assay kit to measure uh, LH using anti-HCC antibodies. Now, it wouldn't have been possible otherwise to have as many samples of blood that you need to measure LH, but this could be done on urine. And this allowed them to monitor the LH surge in the natural cycle. And eventually, on the 10th of November, 1977, as we know, Leslie Brown, the mother of Louise, underwent laparoscopic oocyte recovery, as did several hundred patients beforehand. 26 hours after the LH surge was detected in her urine, Stepto looked, scanned the ovary, sorry, looked at, uh, um, they decided to go in and do the laparoscopy. He saw a follicle there, which he said was approximately 30 millimeters. Aspirated the follicle, got the egg, fertilized the egg. We all know the outcome of that particular single case, which changed the course of history for not just uh, now millions of, 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 of patients, but also uh, our, our lives. The embryo was transferred eight, as an eight cell embryo, and it was done at midnight. Three very important points there. The 25th of July, 1978, at 23.47, Louise Brown was delivered. And that, as we know, so it, so it goes, is that's when it all happened. Well, to me, and to anybody who's looking at this history, it's the end of the beginning, but it was the beginning of still many battles and many problems. They had a second birth in January 1979 from a cohort of patients at that time, and he was born in Scotland. So what was the final tally from that work, from 1971 to 1978? 250 patients, 457 cycles, 112 embryo transfers. You can see the data there. And as the, uh, one of the senior regulators in the UK said to me only three weeks ago, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, today these gentlemen would be reported to their professional societies and a long, long time before you get anywhere near 400 cycles, they would have been stopped. Salutary lesson. The other amazing thing about this history is it was coming up to Steptoe's retirement. Had this one pregnancy not been successful, out of all the failures, in September 78, he retired, he was forced to retire from the NHS. That would have been the end of it. That would have been the end of what came next. But I'm going to pause for a minute and just briefly go through, I think, some of the aspects of our history that we should never forget. Landrum B. Shettles. He worked for Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York. On September the 12th, 1973, Shettles creates an embryo after IVF for a couple called the Delzios. The Belgium, who uh, Dr. Van de, uh, excuse my pronunciation, Viele, however you pronounce it, uh, he ordered Shettles to dispose of the test tube and its contents for doing this immoral work in his hospital. So out went the embryo with the test tube. Shettles then resigns. Doctors at the hospital who wanted IVF to continue persuade the Del Zio couple to sue. And they did. And it took a while to get to the courts. Look at the date. The trial began in July 1978. Louise Brown was born on the seventh day of the trial. Because of people like James Watson and others, the defense was very clear. Shettles was a madman. IVF was never going to work. Therefore, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital did the right thing. He was misleading everybody. IVF would never work. In the middle of the trial, Louise Brown was born. 
and the defense had to completely, sorry, the prosecution had to completely re-change their approach. But in the end, the judge awarded obviously in favor of the patients, and they said that Columbia Presbyterian Hospital had behaved utterly and terribly in a civilized community. And a little amusing bit came out of this. They awarded $50,000 of damages to the Delzios, Mrs. Delzio, Dolores, but only $3 to the husband. <laughs> Very quickly, I remember going upstairs to the physiology department library in 1978 and reading The New Scientist and reading about Dr. Subhas Mukherjee who had claimed, it was claimed, had now had the world's second IVF baby, born on the 3rd of October, only weeks after Louise Brown. And it was also claimed that if his claims were true, then the Calcutta doctor's feet might be considered one step higher than that of Edwards and Steptoe. Why? I'll tell you why. They used pergonol and HCG, and we know that uh, from the problems at the time, and we understand the Joneses had the same problems, short luteal phase, whatever it was, the drugs weren't doing as well as the success on the natural cycle, that they decided, or he decided, he, first of all, he took the eggs out by colposcopy, he then froze the embryo, put it back in the next cycle. Without him realizing it, if there was a problem with drugs at that time, because there was no luteal, luteal phase support, he'd overcome the problem. So he not only got an IVF baby, he also got a frozen IVF baby and had been able to do it successfully with stimulation. Now, there are those who have reviewed his records and say, that he should have been rewarded with a second IVF baby. There are still a few who say not. It's going to be very difficult to know the real truth, although many have now given him credit. The tragedy is, just like all the hostility that we were used to at the time, and certainly Bob and Patrick got, he got it in spades. The Indian authorities withdrew his passport. There was a meeting about to happen in in Japan in 1979, of all the figureheads trying to work on this field at the time, he was barred from going. He was kicked out of his department. He was sent to work in another discipline in another part of India. And this is the little girl that's born. She's well known now in India. And it was, was recognized by many in 2008 that he had the world's second IVF baby. The problem is, in 19th of June 1981, he took his own life because of the tragedies that he'd suffered. So I thought I'd do just a little bit of diversion as we're talking about the history. But I'm just gonna take you quickly on now to Bourne Hall. So there was all this going on in the background. Shettles trying to get America the first IVF baby. Would it have happened? We don't know. And Steptoe having to retire from the NHS. It took two more years before the establishment of Bourne Hall. Now, many people still somehow link Bourne Hall and Louise Brown together. You will see, of course, this is not the case. There's a two-year gap. Bourne Hall is a beautiful building, but those of us that worked at Bourne Hall in those days worked in these porter cabins where we had an IVF lab you would not recognize today. You'd put it in a museum, and still you'd look at it and think, what? And all the myths that we worked with at the time, natural cycle was obviously best, so we had to get up in the middle of the night whenever the patients were ovulating. We had to do transfers at night, and the women had to be in the knee chest position for transfer. Steptoe believed in gravity. We had our first born hall meeting in 1981, and these were the practitioners around the world at the time from Australia and um, uh, Scandinavia and everywhere else that were interested in the field. And uh, sadly, there's Bob, there's Jean Purdy, Bob's assistant, Patrick Steptoe, no longer with us. John Webster still lives up the road from me, 15 minutes away, still plays golf three days a week, 82 years of age. He always had a relaxed life. And myself, the goon with the glasses. But we 
had to learn everything. There was so much we did not know. All this list here, all this list here, everything we were learning. And this was a wonderful meeting, the world's, well, our, the Bourne Hall's first IVF meeting in 1981. And here we are out on the lawn. Some people you might recognize, Alex Lapata, Alan Trounson, uh, Howard Jones, many of them. Somebody trying to get a question there, I think it's Lars Hamburger. And we didn't even have incubators. We had desiccators that we put in warming cabinets, not incubators, let alone the high-tech um, time-lapse imaging stuff that we have today. And actually, we had test tubes until I suggested to Bob we were now getting too many eggs to do in test tubes when we started to use Clomid, and we switched to using Petri dishes. I introduced that as soon as we got more than two eggs, because if anybody's tried to work with test tubes and cumulus masses, I tell you, it's unbelievably hard. And then trying to strip the, the zona pellucida, the uh, cumulus cells off, you wouldn't believe how hard it is. And who remembers these things? Slides. <laughs> the days of slides. Well, we, we, we learned so much. We learned things like the, this data here on delayed implantation. We, be, we were beginning to wonder whether humans were experiencing what we saw in animals. Because we were getting women who had two failed negative tests, were told to stop any, any medication they were on. Eventually, they said they felt pregnant. We tested them, they were pregnant, and they delivered. We were learning about the luteal phase. We were learning about so many things. We were learning about how the LH surge changes when we start to add Clomid to the natural cycle, then Clomid and Pergonol, and just how difficult it was to interpret an LH surge. There was a lot of work that was done on embryo kinetics. Today, it's easy. But then we just did not understand what the kinetics should be, let alone the morphokinetics. We were learning all of that at the same time. I won't go into that one. It's a technique of uh, X-ray microanalysis where we looked at the individual elements of spermatozoa that could fertilize and not fertilize. This is an interesting chart of the publications from way back here in 1966 where human IVF is mentioned. And you can see the explosion that really occurred round about 1980. We ourselves published 45 peer review papers between 1980 and 1985. And as we know, it then began to march. In 1980, in June, the Australians had the IVF baby. In 1981, the Americans. Rennie Freeman and Jacques Testar in 82. The Israelis had theirs in 82. And then I was fortunate with uh, three Scandinavians, <coughs> Carl Negren and uh, uh, Mats Wickland. And Lars, we all went to China to teach the IVF. Uh, to, chi to China. We spent several weeks that, uh, doing IVF and achieved the first Chinese IVF baby, which was, that was 1987, delivered in 1988. So you would think it would be plain sailing now. The science is done. We're getting a little bit more successful in how we do it. But no, the criticism was as tough as ever. Only teratogens will result. It's unethical. No self-respecting doctor should be involved. Contric, one of the so-called pioneers in the UK today, used this phrase, Contric. Um, this was one of, the, one of the worst ones in uh, an editorial in the newspapers. The work of Steptoe and Edwards is worse than the backstreet abortionists in Bangor. The reference to Bangor, of course, was where Bob Edwards did his degree. And in 1984... Bob and I published a paper with Chris Evans in Science on the secretion of HCG by human embryos. It's the first time it had ever been not only shown but titrated HCG coming from the human embryo. We had an embryo in vitro, we had two, when I was taking out the culture medium just to monitor this work, for 13 days was the longest period. And when we published this work in 84, we had a writ for murder. That's how it was still felt in those days. Even the language was, was very specific. There was a debate as to whether we should stop calling them embryos and we call them pre-embryos. The Americans eventually used the word concepti. Nobody wanted to use the word embryo. But 
thankfully, we survived the writ. And uh, just recently this year, Louise Brown came and opened our refurbished unit in Manchester. And our website, I wanted to put this up. I think one of the fantastic things that you all, we've all done in, in our field, not only we developed a medical science, we've redefined family life. How significant is that? So finally, this is the Marshall Laboratory in Cambridge, this little corner here, which is my office with a chap called Azim Sarani, who was one of the, uh, the pioneers of imprinting. And it was, this is in this corner here. Finally, on the physiology building, there is a plaque, at last. In the very building, on the steps of that building, in 1980, when the chairman of department stopped me and said, Fischl, you may have a brilliant research career ahead of you. Don't throw it away to work with the devil. He's probably not going to be in the university very long. On that same building, finally, they put this plaque up in recognition of the award of the Nobel Prize. I've given you a really quick overview of what I think is a fascinating history in our field. And I've written it, I've been asked to write it up, and it's, it's, it will now be published in um, Fertility and Sterility in July, as they're doing a special issue, and they will cover also the babies from, I think, Europe and uh, the US and Australia. So I think we've all been very, very fortunate. Yes, th th there were big pioneers. And you know, as I put in my uh, first book in 1986, when I wrote IVF, Past, Present, and Future, that no one person actually creates something giant. It's a small roll of snow that creates that avalanche. But the guys we worked with were certainly giants. And I think everybody else who's worked with us since has helped to move this field to an unparalleled level of um, incredible change to people's lives more than almost anything else because what does matter in the world than being able to procreate, to have children and to allow our species to continue and individuals to feel th that need and that ability to be able to carry on their lives with children. And this, this work has enabled now millions of potential parents to become parents. And so, to the pioneers, all the pioneers, I think it's been a fantastic history. Here's to the future. Thank you very much.